Hey everybody, and welcome back to Ready Steady Play, where we've just finished playing Taverns of Tiefenthal, and we are now going to do our final thoughts on the game. <laughs> so it's uh, it's uh, from the designer of Quacks of Quedlinburg, Wolfgang uh, Warsh. What? Wolfgang Warsh. Uh, well, knowing my bits of German that I do, aren't W's pronounced V's? Wolf, Wolfgang Warsh, I think, would be, I think, of the correct pronunciation. Please shout at me in the comments below if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's Wolfgang, Wolfgang Warsh. Very good. Wolfgang Warsh. I deeply apologize if that's incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably, he's watching, right? <laughs> he's watching. He'll let us know. <laughs> yeah. For I... those of you that don't know what this game is, this is a two to four player game where we're taking... It's a Euro game for sure. Yeah. Like it doesn't involve cards. It doesn't involve dice. It's got some dice drafting and uh, it's got deck building. With automated, automated hand play. And then you use action selection from a dice draft. You do action selection on the automated hand following a dice draft. So it's got a bit of everything. It's very a very Euro feel, but with a few random elements like a deck of cards and a bunch of dice. Mm -hmm. But then those are mitigated somewhat because primarily what you're doing is building decks of cards and you're also drafting the dice. And also you can kind of mitigate the dice by getting uh, these cards that you play out when uh, you from your deck. Yeah. So it's, it's a really interesting, actually, sort of set of mechanisms because it sort of simultaneously makes the game seem really light on the surface. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a surprising amount of thought that you can put into oh, it. Oh, it's so deceptively... Um, it seems so light, but yet so deceptively... Mm -hmm complex in the whole the, the, the ways that you can go around and the yeah. different strategies that you can employ uh, in, in trying to get your tavern going yeah. and it's so with our gameplay as well it's so it's very unpredictable about how it's going to end it can it's really roller coaster, isn't it? Yeah, yeah well, you've that. got to be quite good at card counting and uh, in the last game because you weren't doing so hot not the one we filmed but the one that we didn't air uh, Michael wasn't doing very hot, and it was quite easy to count how many nobles he had. <laughs> but in this game, you had a lot more nobles, and I definitely lost track of them. Yeah. And then I really wasn't sure. I was very... I, I, I lost track of how many nobles I had, too. <laughs> and then uh, that made it very tense. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the, mech the puzzle itself, I find very compelling. We are playing on level 5. The game comes in 5 different levels. Level 1 is the basic game with no frills. And then you just add levels, which are additional bits of complexity, until you get to level 5, which is essentially the full game. And you can't really play... It's not modular, so you've got to just ascend up the ladder of complexity. Yeah. But uh, honestly, I don't think level 5 is that, that complex. complex. It's I not agree. too bad. Um, and um, If I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and you did very well. I, uh, I really enjoyed this as well, actually. And one of the things that was really interesting to me about the game was the way the hand played out automatically because it's quite funny like playing a game like clank or harry potter deck builder um both of which involve deck building um it can often feel like the hand is is entirely sort of there's, there's one optimal way to play it out yeah so you might it might as well be played automatically and then it becomes a choice of in clank like how to spend your feet how to spend your swords and in harry potter i think it's about how to spend your your lightning and coins um, yeah. or something on buying more cards for that so in this game by just taking the way the hand, the deck plays out and actually making these sort of automatic play part of the game which i don't really think i've seen before i that was really interesting mm. and so, somewhat new and intriguing so i really liked that a lot um, I like that the focus was once once they're out here, then we're going to do an action selection thing. Mm -hmm. and the deck building was really all about um, how to mitigate your chances of getting terrible um, tavern layouts. Mm -hmm. So I find that um, having played this a uh, couple of times now, each time there are clearly sort of different approaches. I've tried a few different approaches now, and there are clearly different strategies that are interesting to explore, mm -hmm. but fundamentally it does feel quite similar. Yeah. So I don't think, I think, I don't think you're going to get a lot of re, uh, sort of varied replayability out of this. Having said that, the puzzle is quite compelling and I do enjoy doing it and I'm not bored of it and I don't think I will get bored of it soon. No. I think that uh, it's, I, it is interesting enough. I think it offers definitely in, 
we've played with particular I think it's module four that allows this a lot of replayability with it as well. Mm-hmm. So this is the varied start. So these different cards sort of change what you start with. And you'll deal out three at the start of the game, and each player will pick one, but you can have the same one. But you one. can have the same one, which I like as well, yeah. because then that adds to the different... It's not like you have to be different, so therefore mm-hmm. you can... It's, it's a whole new uh, mechanism of, like... Um, but it also, what I like... Sorry. I was just going to say, it's a whole new mechanism of, of, like, replayability and all the different options that you can have. Sure, it, it, I think it adds a very light level of replayability, but it does add some, which yeah. is nice. And what it also does, which is really nice, is it, it gives you the sort of a different set starting setup and you can use the inspiration from what that starting setup gives you like the whole strategy i had in the game we filmed which is about getting out more tables so that i could host more guests um was really based around what i started with i got to take some of the crappy guests out of my deck so i'd be able to cycle it faster so i felt combo that with the tables Mm -hmm. and see about sort of building this uber combo deck which I just about pulled off because it wasn't until about round eight that it did something particularly spectacular. Six and eight were particularly good, mm. but the rest of the rounds were sort of very middling. But that, and then that's this is in you were you were only able to utilize that because of the this is a random part of it, isn't it? Because eight wasn't very good when you first did it. And you had yeah. to redraw. But uh, you know, but so the game gives you some tools for mitigating the luck. Um, but then, you know, it's sort of like, you know, but uh, to an extent as well, it's about remembering what you've got, you know, like I was sitting there thinking what's in this stack and I can work it out fairly easily because I can see what's on the table. So you can, uh, you get these custom counter here, counter customers here that come into your tavern and sit down and you can spend them after you've done the automated hand. So you're going to basically take your deck of cards and you're going to deal patrons into your pub and also the staff members as well. And uh, when it's full of patrons, you stop. So if you've managed to draw your staff, you're in for a really good round. Mm-hmm. But if you haven't, then you're stuck with all these patrons and nothing to do. Mm-hmm. But what it, these counters can be used to redraw. So you take all of these, you put them into a discard pile, you do it over. And what's interesting is you can kind of predict as well when you're going to have a bad turn. Because if you have a great turn, because of the way the deck building works, next turn is probably not going to be good. Yeah. So you want to save these people for when you're proven right that it's not a very good turn. And then this is all an art in itself, isn't it? It's like, well, and it's somewhat mitigated as well because when you buy these cards, you put them on top of your deck, which gives you this sort of foresight to kind of plan ahead. And so you can think, well, if I know what's coming up or if I want to sort of prepare maybe some groundwork for a good turn next turn, I'll get these additional things this turn and put them on top of my deck. Mm. But, you know, if you plan to use one of these, then there's no point in putting anything on top there because you're going to lose it. And that's interesting, yeah, you know? Agreed. That's a sort of... So it's like one of the things that mitigates the bad luck of the card draw actually conflicts with the other thing that mitigates the bad luck of the card draw. And yeah. it's that's kind of an interesting sort of uh, concept, an interesting decision space. Agreed, 100%. And uh, two of the servers give you sort of ways to mitigate the bad dice draws as well. You've got the dishwasher and the... Uh, the serving wench, who, she gives you additional dice. Well, she he gives you additional you, dice. And but that's a way to sort of mitigate bad dice rolls. Like, you yeah. know, they, they always say that's, that's part of luck as well, isn't it? I guess. Yeah. You had pretty I boss was, rolls. I, this never happens. Well, it's okay, <laughs> because we always say the law of averages. Luck will average out, and it did on the final round. It did. <laughs> <laughs> Just in a different way. Yeah. But uh, you guys will have to go and watch the series. No, no, but, uh, you know, that's always the way you mitigate dice, right? You either give you tools to change the face of the die, yeah. or you just add more dice. Because you throw enough dice and it'll average out, yeah, right? Right. And so that's and so that's really interesting. And what you can do as well is buy these guests, and they have different die faces on them. Mm-hmm. So you start with ones and twos in your deck, and they're rubbish. But then you can buy the three, four, fives. I think there's even a six in there as well. And so if you get all those guests out, that's a bigger spread. You're more able to use your dice. And all of these things. And then you've got this person who makes some dice wild, and all of these. I like things, these. I like these additions, these entertainers, because that adds yeah. a whole new. I think that's uh, module two, it. isn't it? It is. The, and then there's this monster track you can go around for rewards, and this reputation track down here as well. And both of them are completely circular, so you can just keep whizzing going around with both, <laughs> and just recruiting the war- rewards over and over again. So yeah. there, I think there is like scope to sort of create like a, a, a sort of a really cool reputation sort of si- situation where you're kind of balancing money and beers, and then getting lots of bards. Yeah. And I think there's another really cool situation as well where you might get, um, you know, around this monastery track a bunch of times. I'm not quite sure how you'd you'd do that, but it's just, it's just there. So there are these sort of like strategies that you can explore. And I don't think that the different avenues are as possible in 
the module in level one. Yeah. They don't really Agreed. come into their full scope until module five. Until you've added them all and they're all interlinked with each other. I think yeah. that's part of the, the, the beauty of it, really. Well, what, uh, what the extra modules do is they give you a lot more options and they also give you a lot more ways to deal with the dice and Correct. things like that. I, so. think it, I think the game, I don't want to say simple, um, but the game is a lot more... Uh, Luck-driven. Uh, yeah. Luck-driven at more level one, yeah. Yeah. And it gets more interesting to work at, at the fifth level. And then you've got this thing as well and you can kind of do that, you know. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, a lot of sort of interesting strategies that uh, I'm, I'm excited to check out, which is a, in itself a kind of replayability. Really? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and uh, I think I would just say that also the, all the components, they're fine. They're not Kickstarter Exclusive. level. No, no. There's, this is not a Kickstarter. This oh, is a this retail is game. And I was going to say, I think we've been somewhat spoiled mm-hmm. by Kickstarter because we expect these super deluxe products now. I quite like that this is not a Kickstarter product. No, I like that this is a retail game. It's not even that dear. You're looking at maybe £35 for this. Yeah. You know, which is, I think, about $40 now because we hate the pound. But, <laughs> um, you know, but uh, the components are, are fine. I love this little interlocking puzzle board. Me too. You this know, is, this is one of the nicest elements and I these like things about it. Flip over and you can over, upgrade right. them, and that's cool. I would love to see an expansion that adds more puzzle pieces so you can change them out and maybe like diversify your pub. That would be awesome. That would be like guests staying over, so you create bedrooms. Yeah, you could add like a, a like a, an or inn a rest, component, or a restaurant, or like a brewery, so you can like. Maybe you could get like a brewery that replaces this barrel with like a whole lower part here. Oh, maybe, you know, maybe something like that. Maybe instead of getting the schnapps, you create the schnapps. Yeah, or yeah, a distillery. Yeah. So lots of cool ideas in there. So I'm I'm excited to they and I believe they will pursue an expansion with this because they did one for Quacks. That's my theory. But uh, I like it. I I there's find definitely to I go find to it. it. Uh, I think I think and I think there's room in this in it for this in a collection because it's a good middleweight filler euro i think anyone who's into the hobby into euro games will be able to pick up on this no problem and at level one it's a very simple game that you can teach pretty much anybody yeah Yeah. but it's maybe just slightly towards the heavier end of like complete gateway and so it'd be a good maybe next step you know yeah definitely but i think you know i think this is probably something you could play with uh your friends and family Uh, definitely definitely (laughs) (laughs) would you buy it yes Great. Well, that's actually... I'd buy it too. So I think uh, that's a pretty good, solid recommendation from Ready Steady Play for Taverns of Tiefenthal. Yes. Thanks for coming on this adventure with us, guys. And we'll be off tomorrow for an entirely different adventure. Mm-hmm. Bye! See you soon! Mm-hmm.